It's November 2nd, 1960, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Few days so exemplify the coming of the 60s, the decade of free love, the permissive society and anti-establishment thinking, than today in history in 1960, when publishing house Penguin Books was found unanimously not guilty under the Obscene Publications Act for printing an unexpurgated version of a novel whose author had died 30 years earlier, D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover. The book itself was published first in Florence in 1928 and a censored version came out in Britain in 1932. But the Director of Public Prosecutions and Police had pursued this long term against Lawrence's work for decades, burning his 1915 novel The Rainbow, intercepting his post to seize his poem Pansies and also even raiding an exhibition of his paintings. So there was kind of this establishment itching for another battle with Lawrence and here it came. So until this point, the book had never appeared in its unexpurgated form in the UK. And the reason that the landscape had suddenly changed was that until 1959, the previous year, obscenity trials were subject to what was called the Hinken Test, which had been established as the legal definition of obscenity in an 1868 trial, which was about anti-Catholic pamphlets that had been circulated. But within the anti-Catholic message were lurid details, obviously intended to entice interest in the public, involving things such as the questions put to females in confession... <laughs> <laughs> on the, so you can see, you know, I mean, that's going to draw you in, right? More than mm, someone right. going on about papist dogma. But in court, the <laughs> author claimed that his intention was in the public interest. He wanted to, you know, point out the, what was going on in the Catholic Church. But the judge, Judge Coburn, defined obscene material as that which has a, quote, tendency to deprave and corrupt those whose minds are open to such immoral influences and into whose hands a publication of this sort may fall. Crucially, regardless of the intent of the creator and regardless of whether there was any public benefit in the wider work, Yes, and in 1959, the Obscene Publications Act had come into force, which prevented the publication or broadcast of material considered to be obscene, likely to deprave or corrupt. And this was really kind of the test case of this law, which is why, even though Lawrence was dead, and even though it was kind of between the Crown and a publishing house, like it's just a bit almost intellectual, this exercise, it nonetheless ended up at the Old Bailey and on the front of tabloid newspapers every day because it was a test case and because it was the first time that actually what was being asked was not, is it obscene, but is it obscene or does it have literary merit? And Mm. considering that was really the question that was being asked... It's just such an obvious done deal (laughs) that Lady Chatterley's Lover by D.H. Lawrence is going to be found not guilty of obscenity. Penguin were able to line up illustrious person after illustrious person. You know, F.R. Leavis, E.M. Forster, the Bishop of Woolwich to come in and say this is a work of literature. It underlines what the intentions of prosecuting this book were in the first place, which was actually, I think, Lady Chatterley's Lover was controversial because it was literature. It wasn't Mm. porn. You know, you could buy all kinds of stuff in Soho to crack one out to. This wasn't (laughs) that. This was literature. This is for posh people to read, and it's got swear words in it, and it's got anal sex in it. And also, I suppose, that it's high-end literature, but being sold for a bargain price, so available to the masses. And really, this is kind of the thing that... You know, it it demonstrates how out of touch the prosecution were with the social trends of the time. Because, as you say, the prosecution didn't try to even call any witnesses. Actually, they did approach a few people, but the people who they made aware of the fact that this case was going on were all like, oh, no, well, I'm definitely going to be on the side of uh, the defence and actually ended up attesting to the quality and uh, redeeming social merit of the book, the exact thing that the prosecution's case was trying to uh, argue against. So the prosecution really themselves rested on the kind of vulgarity. And it's true, there are many four-letter words in this book. And it does paint an uh, one of those hysterical images of some court clerk having to go through the book and count up the mentions of each of the most heinous swear words. So you had the F word uh, 30 times, the C word 14 times, balls 13 times, R6 times, <laughs> 
cock four times, piss three times, and so on. You know, it's just like when you lay it out to end, end to end, you could see how that was designed to shock, but actually might cause a humorous response, as did a number of the other things that the prosecution tried to lead with. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the famous one, I'll do it, sorry guys, yeah. we all yeah, want to do it. famous <laughs> quote from the trial Re- was This is that- Rebecca Messina, everyone, playing the part of Mervyn Griffith <laughs> Mervyn Jones, Griffith the prosecutor. Jones. Go ahead. <laughs> he famously, famously turned to the jury and asked... Is it a book that you would even wish your wife or your servants to read? Apparently to, you know, sort of quiet tittering. Because not only, you know, the whole thing is very Victorian, isn't it? It's the implication, one, the implication that men would be influencing what their wives or servants are reading. And obviously this peculiar worldview where the whole jury was composed of men with servants. There were three women jurors. Mm. This is actually a callback. Do you remember our episode on um, all women juries? Yes. And there was up into, I think, the 60s in obscenity trials, the defence had a right to request an all-male jury, but Penguin had declined that right because they were gambling on the idea that the women would be more open-minded about what they ought to be reading, whereas if Mm. you had a jury of all men, it might end up being a little bit more paternalistic. But the weird thing about this is that Mervyn Griffith-Jones... This wasn't a one-off. He had a habit of asking these weird, alienating, self-defeating questions. So (laughs) six years earlier... In an obscenity trial, another obscenity trial, over Walter Baxter's novel, The Image and the Search, he asked the jury, when Christmas comes, would you go out and buy copies of the book and hand them round as presents to the girls in the office? And if not, why not? The answer is that it is not the type of book they ought to read. (laughs) That's great. Yeah. I rest my case. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that was his tactic in every trial was to like address a phantom audience of middle class men and ask them if they would buy it for the girls in the office or their servants. I mean, there are so many things sort of under the surface, aren't there? Which is why I open by saying this sort of typifies the 60s and the wave of feminism and sexual liberation and openness and classlessness relatively in England that D.H. Lawrence had actually predicted, really, in his writing Mm. three decades earlier, coming up against this establishment that didn't know how to deal with it and was still paternalistic and was still saying, we all have servants and we don't want them to read this. But I think there was another thing, which is that the story of Lady Chatterley's Lover, which is about an affair between the young, married, upper-class Lady Chatterley and her married, working-class gamekeeper, Oliver Mellors, is predicated on the fact that her husband is impotent, so they're not having sex anymore. And the reason for that is that he was injured in the war. Mm -hmm. And it harked back to this image of Lawrence as a pacifist. And recent biographers have actually disabused that notion and talk about Lawrence being pretty gung-ho for war. He just didn't like the First World War. Mm -hmm. But the point is this image of Lawrence being a working-class pacifist who was into free love had kind of stuck in the public imagination. And even though this is years later, 1960, I suppose it's only 15 years after the Second World War. And so there's still this feeling of, like, that's one of the things that makes him a baddie. Mm. He wrote this story about someone who was injured in the war and then his wife cuckolded him because he'd done his duty. Yeah. I mean, at least one person who was receptive to this let's face it, quite snobbish direction that the prosecution was going in was Mr. Justice Byrne, the judge on the case. And he, in his summary to the jury, noted that they must be attentive to the fact that this would, quote, be available for all and sundry to read. You have to think of people with no literary background, with little or no learning. And I I read this article that's now on the Penguin site where, you know, they have quite a lot to crow about in this case. But they said, this trial represented the blunt force of the law used to attempt to slow social change, a tactic with a long record of failure, as we still see in government responses to political protest. You know, this really was kind of the establishment going, this is what you ought to be able to read and this is what you ought not to be able to read. Yeah, I think what arises out of this is that the four-letter words and the sex scenes were a bit of a smokescreen, really. That Mm. wasn't really what it was about. It was about should working-class people be able to read stories in which working-class people have sex with aristocrats. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, and enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, they both it. enjoy it. I mean, it would be okay if nobody <laughs> enjoyed it. It would be, but it would, wouldn't it? But, it would but, be okay if yeah. the gamekeeper died. Yes, yeah. if it was exactly. But and you can see this. This is the remarks of Lord Hailsham in the House of Lords, and this is after the trial is over. And you can see from the way he's talking, it's like he's lost his mind, and he's talking about these fictional characters like they're real. And you can see exactly what bothers him about it. He says. <laughs> 
Before I accept it as valid or valuable or even excusable, the relationship between Lady Chatterley and Mellors, I should like to know what sort of parents they became to the child. <laughs> I should have liked to see the kind of house they proposed to set up together. I should have liked to know how Mellors would have survived living on Connie's rentier income of £600. <laughs> right, the book then. <laughs> yeah. I mean, seriously. Right, the fictional boring yeah. sequel. <laughs> Lady Chatterley's rentier's income. The not, the not a fan fiction version. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tomorrow. Plus the poo, the torrents of poo, <laughs> presumably. <laughs> I was going to say, I haven't seen that headline. <laughs> Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, part of the ACAST Creator Network.